as, as Aphrodite said, I am the Dean of the School of Public Health, and I have worked in a variety of different capacities over the course of my career. But quite frankly, since March of this year, it's been all about COVID all the time. And so at our school, we've done a lot of work. I'm going to share some of that with you today. But so I, as I was thinking about this talk, and I didn't know exactly how to put it, you know, what I should talk about, I, I, I particularly chose the title for this reason, because while I think what I'm going to share with you today is a snapshot of an epidemic that continues to be a huge burden to our society here in the United States and in Greece and other parts of the world. I do always believe, like everything else in my life, that there's hope. And that, you know, in humanity, we find hope. And with hope, we are going to see our way through this. And I keep telling my friends, including my friend Marion, who I know is on this on this webinar here with us today, um, who is my travel companion to Greece, because we've been building a program in Greece over the last few years. Um, by next June, I think we're going to be in a, in a different place. But let's, let's see where we are today. I do want to talk a little bit about the School of Public Health also before I start, because we have spent a lot of time over, I've been at the school since 2017. 17. I've just entered my fourth year. One of the the, the most um, immediate things I undertook when I when I took over the school was to develop our international and global program. And so we had a global public health program. And um, I was able with my partner, Marion, and others um, at the school to extend that program beyond the borders of the United States. And so while it is the natural tendency of schools of public health to go to places like Africa and Asia, I said, well, I'm going to go to Greece because it seems to me that there are public health problems in Greece. It seems to me there are economic conditions in Greece, and we should go to Greece. And so Marion Passanante who, by the way, is sort of Greek because her daughter married a Greek, so she kind of counts that way. Um, and I have been going back and forth, and we actually, last year, for we developed a, a set of collaborations, and last year uh, enacted an amazing course on migration and public health, where our students went to Athens for a week, studied with the students at the uh, National School of Public Health, which is now part of the University of West Attica, and then went to... Um, Kios and work with migrants for a week. This summer, we were going to do a course on the Mediterranean diet and health, but you know, like everything else, it got postponed. Still, we are going to continue to do this work. Um, one of the most important things we're planning to do is when we get through this pandemic, we're going to do, we're going to have a meeting of all our partners from Africa and Asia and the United States in Athens to talk about HIV, the global pandemic. And we're going to make Athens the epicenter because many of my collaborators also work in Athens in that domain. So lots of exciting things happening uh, around Greece at the School of Public Health. Coincidentally, the dean happens to be the child of Greek immigrants, so you know there's no coincidence there at all. So, as Aphrodite said, I am the dean. I'm also, you know, like many Greek Americans, a first generation scholar. My parents came to the United States from Kos in the 1950s. My father owned a grocery store. My mother worked as a clerk. Um, in their one generation I've been able to be in this position thanks to their hard effort. They're not long, no longer with us, but I'm working diligently every day to reestablish my Greek citizenship. So I'm sorting through all of their papers that I had from when they immigrated to the Greece in the 1950s. So that's just a little bit about me. So next slide, please, Dr. Lipi. So the word COVID-19 is used all the time to describe the epidemic. That is, in fact, the disease that manifested. But in fact, the virus that causes COVID-19 is SARS-CoV-2. This is a virus. It is a virus like HIV. It's a virus like H1N1. It enters the body like all viruses, as all of you, all of you know, cannot infect without infecting cells. It cannot reproduce without re infecting cells. But when it infects, it, creates, it can create the disease COVID-19. Next slide, please. So what does it feel like when somebody has COVID-19? You all know this or this also. People can get fevers or chills, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, body aches, headache, loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion, runny nose, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And there's an increasing list of symptoms. However, what we also know is that Anywhere between 40 to 50 percent of individuals who are infected with COVID of SARS-CoV-2 never develop symptoms. And so this makes our situation much more complicated because it's not so easy to detect people, people who are walking around feeling perfectly healthy and perfectly fine. And so 
as I get to the end of the talk, I'll be talking about strategies. And one of the strategies that I think we have to think about very diligently is how we continue to enact testing, even for those who are feeling well. Next slide, please. And so what's going on? You know, in the early 1900s and certainly at the height in 1918 and 1919, infectious diseases were killing so many people around the world. And we saw over the course of the 1900s, you know, the 20th century, a decline. But in the last 40 years, something is happening. And something is happening where infectious diseases such as HIV and Ebola and H1N1 and now SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 begin to emerge. So while we, while public health has really concerned itself a lot in the last, you know, several decades with chronic disease like obesity and, you know, cardiovascular disease, you know, due to smoking and lack of exercise and what have you, and we continue to be worried about those things, all of a sudden it seemed that we have to be on guard again around infectious diseases because we are in a global society. We all travel back and forth throughout the world. Infectious diseases is bound to continue to emerge as we, as we move forward. And so it is my hope and my dream that countries will respond to epidemics in the future like Greece did, and I will talk about Greece in a minute and how well they did, um, and be prepared to take very serious action to contain these diseases. Next slide, please. So this is a snapshot as of yesterday, maybe two days ago. They all blend after a while. What year is this? What month is this? I don't even know anymore. But here is a snapshot of the epidemic around the world. And what you can see is as the color becomes more red, the more concentrated the infections are and the diseases are. So we see like high rates of infection in the Americas, the United States and Brazil and Argentina. We see um, in Europe, increasingly high rates in Spain and France and Italy and Greece remain in the yellow zone, moderately low right now, but again, increasing. And we keep the, our eyes on these things every single day. Next slide, please. So if we to blow this up and we just look, and we look just at Greece, what we see in Greece is that there have been about 16,000 total cases in the population and only 300, I mean, there should be zero deaths, but only 357 deaths, which is a relatively small number. There's 3.1 new cases per day for 100,000 people in Greece. So, you know, it's not like it's, there's no new infections, but it's a relatively low. Let's compare that to the next slide, which shows us Italy which has had 302,000 cases, 35,000 deaths, and about 2.6 daily new cases per 100,000. So Italy and Greece, the infection rates are about the same right now, right? But clearly Italy, one of the first epicenters of the epidemic was devastated by the disease with 35,000 people dying. And now let's take it one more step further. Here's the United States. The United States has had 6,800,000 cases and to over 200,000 deaths. I think this morning was 206,000 deaths with a daily new case average of 13 per 100,000. So think about it, four times. So when you control for the population, what the per 100,000 does is that it, it puts the populations on equal playing field, right? So you can't just say how many infections in Greece, there's only 11 million people in Greece. There's 350 million people in the United States. How do you compare those? Well, you put them on a common denominator over 100,000, right? And so Italy and Greece have about three per 100,000, but the United States has four times that amount. Per 100,000. So the infection is spreading wild here. New York, which is one of my homes, I, I navigate between New York and New Jersey. There were over a thousand cases for the first time since June uh, on Sunday. So we are not moving in the right way. Next slide, please, Aphrodite. And this is a map of the United States, which shows you as of two days ago, the snapshot of where the infections really are. And if I show you this in March, it would all be in the Northeast, but that has completely, completely changed. And now we see very much the center part of the country vastly infected. And we keep our eye on this. If these maps are interesting to you and you're a data geek like I am, I just love numbers and I love things like this. 
Um, the Global Health Institute at Harvard has this information available in real time. You can break it down and look at you know every country and every location. You can blow up New York. You can look up New Jersey. You can look at all the country and you can get information like this. Next slide, please. So, as I said earlier, part of the problem in containing this disease, and this is not data, this is just a hypothetical pie chart, is that, you know, while, you know, everyone can get infected with this disease, and this disease is very, very easy to spread, much easier to spread than HIV and other diseases, right? It is born through the air, it is, it's, it, we don't, the surface is a question anymore, but it, the fact that it's airborne makes it highly, highly communicable. Despite that, about 50% of people are not going to get any symptoms. 45% of people about are going to get some symptoms that feel like a cold. And 5%, the ones we see on TV all the time or on our videos all the time, are the ones who get sick with a death rate of about 1% to 5%. So, so I think part of our challenge in, in managing all of this is getting people to realize that even one death is too many, right? But the fact is that the, when we don't see in front of us, when we don't see in front of our eyes that, that, that death is happening all around us, then we are less likely to take things as seriously as we might. Next slide, please. All right, so by comparison here, uh, what you see here is in, the, in these shades of a Halloween pumpkin color things is a H HIV, which is um, on the left side, 39 million deaths. And then H1N1, what was used to be called the Spanish flu, 575,000 uh, um I'm sorry, sorry, 50 million deaths. Um, then we see H1N1 in the middle there with 575,000. That's the most recent in 2009. And then already close to a million deaths of SARS-CoV-2. All right. So clearly, like with this, you know, HIV has taken 40 years to kill 39 million people. COVID-19 has taken less than one year to kill almost one million people. So this disease is very, very powerful, and it remains unbridled. We'll continue to take lives. The thing that is the most close to me in comparison to it is the epidemic of 1918, right, which has had some 50 million deaths, and we continue to learn every day what it's like, how many people actually died. Next slide, please. And again, this is an overall case comparison. And I, what I try to do here is have Greece and Italy and um, the United States. Again, the number is much bigger in the United States than any than any of the other countries. The other countries are actually smaller. But still, again, I think it, it, it's important to keep in scope. It's interesting. You can't I could not, despite all of my effort, try to find the, the number of deaths of swine uh, of um, the Spanish quote unquote Spanish flu, the 1918 flu um, in Greece. And so that remains blank there. But clearly SARS-CoV-2 is very high in numbers in the United States. Next slide, please. So, and here again also is the, another way of looking at the mortality rate, because I, you know, I'm a statistician, I always think about banging these things over people's heads. And if you look really, really closely here, what you see, what you see in Greece is only four deaths per 100,000 as compared to the United States, which has 74 deaths per 100,000. In Greece, only 164 cases per 100,000. In the United States, 2,500 cases per 100,000. So Greece is clearly doing something right, and I have some ideas about why that is. We're maybe not doing something so right in our country. And maybe we have to think about how we do business here. I will tell you that I think one of, when my goddaughter called me, who my goddaughter who lives in Halandri called me and said to me she had to text to leave her apartment during the height of the pandemic, I applauded that because, but can you imagine trying to do that in the United States? And I said to her, next slide, please. And so since the beginning of the pandemic, the total number of cases in Greece, as I said, is about 16,000, only only slightly over 300 deaths in Greece. Greece was a model for other European countries. They, and the, 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 the prime minister started canceling events in late, in late February before a single death was recorded. Schools and universities closed on March 10th. Cafes, restaurants, and tourist spots closed on March 13th. And the Greek government moved quickly 
um, in part because of its healthcare system being, you know, somewhat broken over the last 10 years. But the public accepted lockdown measures and good health, I think, is very much part of our culture. So let me tell you how I explained it to somebody who interviewed me. Oh, it's actually Aphrodite's person who interviewed me a few months ago. I said, there's something about being a Greek which makes you care about your family and the people around you, your village, your family, your yaya, your papu, everybody. And that philosophy and that thinking that we have to care for those people around us, that altruism that we have for those that we love, right, is, I think, has been the saving grace for Greeks, that we care that not everybody does, but as a culture, we tend to embrace and love and care and very different from the United States, right? Where families are not big and connected, right? I complain all the time about my big fat Greek family. I wouldn't trade them in for the world, okay? Because anytime there's a crisis, they're there. And that's wonderful. Next slide, please. So uh, what was different about the Greek approach? Well, the Greeks trusted experts. They trusted their epidemiologists and their public health experts. They trusted, they trusted science. What else did they, what else was different about Greece? They were quick to respond very fast. The prime minister, whether or not you agree with, agree with his politics or not, he acted very quickly. Transparency, very clear messaging from the beginning. So there was no confusion whatsoever, right? The public health system was strengthened. 35 med medical professionals were embedded into the public health system. The government worked with foundations. And even though the church continues to be powerful, as we all know, as I am finding out increasingly as I'm trying to get my citizenship, right? Because it wasn't enough that my parents were married in St. Demetrius, right? I gotta give them, I have to give them all this proof that I'm really, really Greek. Um, the fact is that even despite the strength of the church and then the culture, Things were shut down because they had to be shut down. And even though it was around Pascha, right? And everybody did what they needed to do. I will say as a New Yorker, I am very proud to work, every, walk by every day, but down, I live in the financial district in New York City to see the, the, the church slowly but surely that got destroyed in 9-11 coming back together again. And I, you can see the cross at the top and it makes me very happy every time I walk by that. Next slide, please. So what do we do to contain this thing? So vaccine, 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 vaccine. That's all people keep talking about, right? Vaccine, vaccine. Sadly for us in the United States right now, over 50% of people don't trust that idea of a vaccine, of a vaccine coming out. We will have a vaccine. We will probably have a an approved vaccine sometime at the end of this year. I trust we will. But to get it to the millions of Americans who are going to need it and to get people to actually take it, it's going to take a long period of time. So even though a vaccine may be approved in November or December or like maybe November 2nd, um, the chances are that most people will not be vaccinated to the middle of next year. And so what we have in the meanwhile is what I've been talking about and my friend Marion has been working on with me is this idea of targeting high risk communities where so we could test them then treating them as much as possible, which is keeping them isolated and what have you and then doing contact tracing. Next slide, please. And just as a matter of clarity, there are lots of different kinds of COVID tests out there. The kind that it, it, that, is the, that is used most actively and that you have most probably have heard about is the test that looks at for presence of the virus. And that's either through a swab in the nose or through saliva that was developed at Rutgers University. That's a PCR test. It looks for the virus. There's also an antigen test that just has come forward, which is a test that looks um, for, for antigen. And it does, it's a quick test, but there's a lot of error like for that. And then there's an antibody test, which looks for whether or not you've been exposed. So an antibody test just tells you if you've had the virus. The problem is that based on the science, it looks that only 20, 20% 20, 20 of people maintain their, their antibodies over time. So we don't know. So we don't know how antibodies play out on this. The bottom line is to this is that I say to all of you is that if you have any doubt that you are feeling sick or have a symptom or just may have been exposed, you go and have a PCR test right away. And that way you and you keep away from people. That's the best advice I have. Next slide, please. And so we. In addition to that, have been working in New Jersey, we've developed a contact tracing program. Many of you will have heard that every state has its own contact tracing program. Marion and others who work part of our school developed the training program for the state of New Jersey. Contact tracing is something that's very common. 
it's used with all infectious diseases. Um, it's when somebody, when there's an infection and somebody is, in, somebody is found out to be infected, they ask that person to reveal all the people they may have infected, which is different from disease to disease. The problem for us with COVID is that people who we may not even know who we're standing next to might be infected. So it's very possible that I'm standing in a crowd somewhere and somebody is infected. And if I'm not covered or they're not covered, I may become infected. But then the person doesn't know who I am or my phone number or anything. So how does contact tracing work? So the other piece of my recommendation as you all open your businesses and you all think about all of this, because I think I think schools, elections, and opening of businesses are the three most important things we have to do over the next few months is masks, 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 washing stations, limited capacity, and keeping people apart as much as possible. Next slide, please. And so what I think worked in New Jersey was that the government worked with the Department of Health, worked with the School of Education, and we work with the businesses. So during the week, I live in Newark, where, I, where my apartment is. And I will tell you that the businesses are very careful there about distancing people at the restaurants, making sure that people have masks on. When I order my delivery, which I do almost every night, the Grubhub person or the person just meets me at the door fully masked. These are these little steps, which I know are enormous and conveniences for everyone. Like, I don't want to wash my hands every day, every five minutes. I don't want to wear a mask all the time. I don't. I'm actually now going to the gym here when I'm in New York. It is really, really, really hard to work out with a mask. It really is. But I do it because you know what? I'm not going to have my brother who's living with MS die. I'm not going to have my aunt, my tia Katina, who is like 75 years old. But I'm not going to have that happen because of me. So my responsibility is to them. And so that's the message I think we need as people and as Greeks, because we really get it as Greeks, right? That we have to care for each other. Next slide, please. Um, so the contact tracing curriculum is basically this. We train people for 18 hours. A lot of what we did in the contact tracing program is really teach people how to be, have cultural humility. Because how you talk to my yaya is going to dis be different than how you talk to somebody's abuela or somebody's grandmother, right? Every culture has its different ways. So we hired people. We have a large, we have a large group population of students in Greece in, at Rutgers too. But we had hired students, which I think is on the next slide, maybe. Mm. One more. Eh, okay, back. Never mind. Back, back to the previous slide. Thank you. I'm sorry, Afroditi. Um, you know, we hired people who were New Jersey, next one, New Jersey residents who spoke all these different languages. I think they ended up in speaking 22 different languages, our contact tracers. So they, many of them were first generation folks. So they understood the culture. And we tried as much as possible to work with the Department of Health to place them where they could actually do the most help. Next slide, please. I mean, just think about this, right? If you're like working in a Greek community, like you want Aphrodite to be a contact tracer, right? That would be good because she can, she understands the culture. She understands the language. She can understand the nuances and that kind of understanding and that kind of trust that you build with people is really critical for contact tracing. And I think it's the same thing with opening businesses. I said earlier a sentence that I sort of, I, think I let sort of slip out of my mouth, but it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat it again. I think the three most important things we have to focus on for the remainder of the year are one, how we're going to manage our schools because it's not so good right now. Number two, how do we continue to keep our businesses open now that it's getting colder, especially in the Northeast? And how do we keep our restaurants open, especially in the Northeast? Um, and then number three, making sure that everybody gets to vote safely. Right. And so there's lots of different ways to do that. But as business owners, you know, here are some suggestions of how you can, can open your business. Stagger the return of your employees. So at Rutgers, for example, which is my is my boss, we not everybody's back in the office. Only segments of the population are back in the office. Like the researchers are back in the office. The faculty are not. Because you know what? The faculty can teach like this for now, if needs be, right? So if we're not, if we can do it online, we do it online. For your businesses, who are the most important people that have to be back and stagger them in? Number two, monitor employees' health. Clearly, we're taking temperatures at the door. Eh, that's, that to me actually is more like to make people calm. Not everybody who has temperatures. It's not a bad idea, though, to do it anyway. Take the temperatures at the door. 
I have a little COVID station in my home myself where I have my postdoc thing and my thermometer and all of those things that I do every, and my blood pressure because I'm Greek, right? So I have to measure my blood, my blood pressure every morning. Like we're like known for our cardiovascular disease as we Greeks. And I, we, but monitoring your employee's health. So testing right now, the recommendation is, you know, assuming that people are not gathering largely, you could do it every week, but if people are interacting every few days, testing just to keep it safe increasing and cleaning the disinfecting and disinfecting i think we all know this surfaces have to be kept clean the air has to be kept clean limiting gatherings so while we like our big fat week weddings we can't have our big fat week weddings we can have our small week weddings for now and then when things get better we can have our big fat queen weddings again and then finally keeping open lines of communication so people feel safe if people feel safe to tell you they feel sick then you're going to contain the disease even more Next slide, please. And so there, not every business is the same. And I'm sorry, this chart, if you don't see it very clear, you can have, uh, by the way, we can share the slides with everyone afterwards. Um, but what you see here is that different businesses have different levels of risk, right? So, you know, on the upper right-hand side, in the very dark gray area, it's both people are closer to each other and there's more likely for exposure. So not every single business is the same and not every single business needs to have the same rules applied. But for example, the subway has to be cleaned constantly, right? And that's it. Restaurants, yes, are risky, but perhaps less risky because we limit people there. And if we're eating outside, it's even better. Or supermarkets or grocery stores or Mediterranean foods or any of those places, we stagger people in, they don't have to be high risk environments as much as other places are. So there's ways to do this so that people's finances don't fall apart, which is critically important for our society also, but to do it safely so people's yayas don't die either. Next slide, please. So I'm going to now, and I think I'm going to end it here. This is, I have a, a set of slides to show you that I think, again, illuminate where we are. This is the number of new COVID cases from December of last year to a few days ago. United States continues to be extremely high, right, in the number of new infections. Some 50,000 new infections. Next slide. And here is Greece, also going in the wrong way. And next slide, please. And here is Italy. Oh, we're going, we're going, now we're going to go to a rain after this. And here is Italy also going in the wrong way. And what is happening, I think, in Italy and Greece, again, the numbers on the left-hand side, if I, you go to the next slide after the will make the point. Here's the United States. And Italy and Greece are right at the bottom. You can't really tell that there's any, any infection. So comparatively speaking, Italy and Greece have nothing compared to the United States, but they are going in the wrong direction. And what I think has happened in Greece was as the country slowly opened, infection and the people got looser and the summer happened, infection started to spread. And so the Greek government is once again thinking about what strategies it needs to use in order to potentially close things down again. It will be easier to probably close things down now that the Galoqueri is over, right? But, you know, in the United States, I would not be surprised in, if several states, I would not be surprised if New York and New Jersey closed down again in the next couple of months if the numbers continue to go to the do. So we're going to have to have, you know, the enemy. We're going to have to be strong here over the course of the next few months because it's going to be very challenging. My other recommendation to all of you who run businesses, make sure that your employees get their flu shots. Because confusing the flu with COVID-19 is going to be very common. And we don't want to deplete the medical workforce from over-focusing on people who just, I hate to say the word, just have the flu, right? But the flu vaccine is readily available. You can go get it right now. And people should get vaccinated right, right away. Next slide, please. So what the future holds? Well, you know, we have a reemergence of infections that we're going to have to keep our eye on. We have to be prepared. We're going to have preliminary approval of our vaccines, hopefully. Hopefully with rollout by 2021, we should be prepared for closures again, you know, with the with, with gyms and restaurants. Maybe as we go to indoor dining, for those of you that live in California or in the, in the Southwest or in the South, you may not have this. But those of us who live in New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania are going to get winters around the corner here. It's going to be very difficult, although 
we could put those big heaters outside and that would work perfectly fine too. So that's another suggestion as we move forward, keeping things open, at least for the winter. Remembering that we don't know ultimately everything about this disease and it looks like the disease continues to exist in people for very long periods of time. And these people known as long haulers develop a, a bunch of symptoms. So keep your eye on the epidemic, keep your eye on the information because the information is changing every single day. Um, we're going to need to, as moving forward, continue to think about how we continue to interact with each other. This is not going to be the last pandemic we're going to face. What are we going to do to make sure we're prepared next time? I hope next time the United States has another pandemic, we have a playbook that we're actually following, that we can all have a response. I think part of our problem in the United States, like different from Italy and Greece, Italy had one response, Greece had one response. The United States had 51 responses. So when you have 51 responses, it's much more difficult to control it. Um, and then, of course, I, I would be I would be remiss not to say to continue to fund public health and prevention, because what has happened was public health was really, really starved prior to this epidemic. Now it seems to be getting attention again. And next slide. And that's it. And that's all I have for you for this for this session. Uh, I hope you found it enjoyable and I'm happy to entertain any questions or have a discussion about some of the ideas that I presented with, for you. Dr. Halkidis, what can I say? That was absolutely incredible. Wow. Oh boy, oh boy. Okay, everyone, get your questions ready. Please add them into the chat box in the lower right-hand corner and we'll try to get through as many as possible. Okay. So, first question, Dr. Halkidi. How come coronavirus is still persisting even at low levels if people are wearing masks and social distancing? Yeah, it's a great question uh, because, folks, well, one, not everybody's wearing masks. Two, not everybody's, and I call it physical distancing because I think I'm still being social. We're all here socializing with each other other so i call it physical distancing people aren't physical distancing and number three what i think really has happened over the course of the last month is we saw spikes after memorial day we saw spikes after july 4th we saw spikes after labor day so every time there's been a holiday and people have socialized like at barbecues and picnics and stuff like that that's what happened so that's why you and all you need is one infection to exist and the possibility that it spreads goes on that's why Wow, wow, wow. Okay, how is Cyprus looking? How's, oh, I can look. I don't know off the top of my head how Cyprus is looking, but I, let me look right now because I want to do that for you. Hold on a second. Uh, global, I want to give this person an answer. Global health, COVID, I'm going on my internet. What do we ever do without the internet? I have no idea. Um, one second, please. I'm keep it. Ask me another question after the okay, okay, keep okay. and then I look at the top. Okay, okay. Uh, do you have any numbers on rates of transmission for people working in very high risk jobs like dentists? Yeah. So what I want to say to that answer is the following. I actually think. Um, hold on, I'm almost, I'm almost at my dashboard here. I actually think dentist office and hospitals are some of the safest places that there are right now because there is high, that there's a high awareness there. So if I, if you asked me this question in March, I would have said they're highly risky, but I actually think that right now, those locations, um, I'm trying to find Cyprus here. Those locations are among the most um, safe in the world because doctors and dentists and um, and other healthcare providers are being extremely careful. I'm almost at Cyprus. Okay, Cyprus. So Cyprus has 1.7 cases, new cases per hundred thousand. Um, um, so um, that's pretty low. Um, um, it's actually. Let me actually look at it. See if I can get some more information on Cyprus here. Yeah. So. The, 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 the number of infections has remained, has gone up a little bit like, like Greece has, but it's actually remains really pretty low compared to, 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 to Greece, to the main, to the mainland and to the other islands. So, uh, it's in pretty good shape. And one could argue, I wonder, here's an interesting hypothesis. Is it because I've lost my Zoom? Where's my screen? I don't even know. I can't see any of you anymore. Uh, could it be because, you know, in fact, it is because um, the island is self-contained to some extent, you know, and that may actually have something to do with it. Excellent. Okay, so I have another question here. 
Do you think fake news has affected the U.S. <laughs> as it has in Greece? Oh, my God. Why are you putting me on the spot here, kids? Tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow's the debate. Why are you asking me? Of course it has. I'm a scientist. I think information matters and knowledge matters and information matters. And, you know, um, I think that when we tell people, look, I get it. Like you want people to be calm. I totally understand because what we know from 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 the literature is too much fear causes a lot of anxiety and anxiety causes risk. So too much fear is not good. But let's not but 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 saying that the, the epidemic is going to be gone next month or there's not going to be it's going to go away. That's not helping anybody whatsoever. Um, but I, I balance that with keeping people calm. Right. So when I do interviews and I do them all the time, I'm like, look, people are afraid. They are afraid. Don't people are not rational. They don't make decisions about um, we don't we don't make decisions that are based on reason and logic all the time. If we did, we'd be all perfect human beings, but we're not perfect human beings and our emotions. I just wrote an article that's going to come out for the American psychologist that is dedicated to my mother and my father. My father died at 57 years old from stomach cancer. My mother died at 76 years old. Both of them, she's, she was at least within the right age. Both of them died because they had such fear and distrust of the medical system. And they should not have died that young. And so I think we have to realize that we have a role to play as doctors and as public health people in making people feel comfortable and safe, right? So being comfortable and safe doesn't mean you just bombard them with scary information. It means you also realize that people are afraid. So you've got to find a way of balancing all of this. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you. I think that's really key, finding a good balance to all that. Uh, any questions for Dr. Halkitis, please remember to enter them into the chat box in the lower right. Uh, another question here, Dr. Halkitis. Do you think the vaccine should be tested in high-risk neighborhoods or high-risk populations? Uh, uh. I think it has to be, if vaccine is to actually be proven to be effective, it should be tested across all populations. So when I'll tell you my HIV story, because that's a good story. So when HIV medications first came out in the middle of the 1990s, they only tested them on men. And when, they, when women started to take them, they would had horrible, 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 horrible side effects. So I want to know that it's going to work in men and women, it's going to work in all races, it's going to work on all age groups. And so I think the broader the population, the better. Marion, can you pipe, pop, pop in with an, and, and add to that answer? My friend Marion, she's an epidemiologist. What do you think, Marion? Can you speak? Is she allowed to speak? Avraditi, MP, MP. Yes, I can speak. <laughs> oh, go. There she is. Marion, speak. Okay, so I know I, I totally agree uh, that we need to be testing this. Hi, <laughs> thanks for letting me join. Uh, it needs to be tested in all populations in order for us to really see uh, if it's A, effective and B, safe. And so we really have to wait until the trials are completely done, uh, unless it's overwhelmingly clear that they're working and that they're not causing major problems. That's my colleague who's Greek by marriage. Oh, Her daughter wonderful. is, at least. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know a lot of people are afraid of uh, taking the vaccine. So do you suggest a lot of people take it right away? Should people wait until, yeah, okay. I think, I don't know, Mary, what you think. I think that, look, let's wait for the trials. Let's see what comes out. Um, let's see, make sure that, the, let's see that it doesn't kill anybody. That's what, let's start there. How about that? And establish we don't kill anybody. I personally, I'll tell you my own personally, I'm not going to run to get it, right? So, but there may be segments of the population get into getting to the point that the other person made that might be vulnerable who may want to get the, the vaccine early because they might be more vulnerable to the disease. But I think eh, we've got to wait for the trials. We wait. And the other thing is we have to convince, because you know everyone, before this epidemic, we had an anti-vaccination problem in this country too. Right. And so we're going to have to think about that. Um, yeah. And, and the other thing to remember is that even with a vaccine, people are going to have to still probably wear masks. Yeah. Uh, not everyone is going to get the vaccine and it may not work equally well on everyone. So there will be uh, it will still need to have take precautions. Thank you very yeah. much for pointing that out. And it, let me and one more thing also, because Marin just reminded me right now, it looks like the vaccine has to be two doses. Right. So so. 
like HPV vaccine, which is three doses, I, I can tell you because I have a study on this, no, so many people don't go back for the following doses. So this is going to only work, again, human behavior. How many of you don't have never haven't finished your antibiotic? How many of you don't go to the gym five days a week? Oh, I do. But how many of you don't eat properly every day, right? All of these things that we do as human beings requires, this is going to require two doses. We've got to make sure we get people back for the second dose. Couldn't agree more. Okay, I have some more questions coming in. You guys ready? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, do you agree that vaccinations should be voluntary and not mandatory? Uh, my personal belief, my, my personal belief is that vaccination should be mandatory okay. for, every, for, for any, any, if I worked alone and lived in my house and was a hermit, then my, I don't care. But if I'm going to live in the world and go to the Agora and like shop and to Bloomingdale's and to everywhere then, and send my kids to school, then I think it's my obligation as a citizen to vaccinate. That's my feeling. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Another question. Also, how can we prepare ourselves for the oncoming second wave in the winter? Okay. So I wish, I wish I could show you my closet. I have like 96 rolls of paper towels in there right now. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm telling you like my biggest problem, the, the last, the last time around is like, I really don't have any paper towels. So how do you prepare? Okay. So, uh, and I'll ask Marin to add on to, I would say, I would I would stock up on some things. I would I would actually get some toilet paper and paper towels and canned goods and because we don't know what's going to happen. Number two, um, you can't go to events if, if if you have to go to work, fine. But no events where there's more than three or four people. That's just you can't do that, right? As much as possible, try to stay in your home with your family. I know it's challenging, right, for all of us, but stay in your home with your family use that as, as as entertainment i would say next get a flu vaccine like now like today uh, i would say make sure you have a thermometer in your house make sure you have an, a, a, a pulse ox machine in your house you can get them on amazon just you know i have a little COVID station like every morning i tell you i get up and i do all of this right and i just check it the oxygen is actually a much better indicator than the temperature i think because if your oxygen levels get really low you're not breathing right and you know so there's not enough oxygen there so i would say those are some things you want to do and then the last thing i would say is you got to keep watching the news because it's, and, and which news, I don't know what to tell you. You got to keep reading the science, right? And like, uh, and seeing what's happening because every day it's new. Like, I don't know now anymore, is coffee good for me or bad for me? I have no idea. Like some studies said it's good for me. Some said, I'm going to believe it's good for me. So, cause I keep drinking it, but that's what I think you need to do. What else would you do, Marion? What else would you do? Anything else? Uh, I would say also make sure that you keep uh, a good supply of your medications on hand. So um, ask your doctor for those three or six or nine months to get the medications that you have so that if there's a problem, you're, you're taken care of. So all the things that Dr. Halkid has already mentioned, but just also medications. Great. Because we know, we know all of our Greek friends here, like me, are probably a lot of them are on blood pressure medication. Because <laughs> our people have this problem. Marion's too, because she's Italian. They have that problem too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next question. Do you think the virus will persist and is it or will it become milder either through prior exposure or mutations making the virus milder dominating? That's a great question. It happened with HIV. HIV 2 is milder first version of HIV 1. Uh, I don't, uh, yeah, I mean, it will, I mean, here's the thing that we know about viruses and bacteria, they mutate, right? Why do we have a, why do we have, mar why do we have staph infections? Because the virus, the bacteria mutated and now we have antibiotics that don't work. So it may mutate. I, I think the bigger question is what happens if you've been infected once? Does it come back again? Right? So for example, I'm going to disclose, I, I told you I had it, right? I, I four days, like, oh, I didn't tell you. I, I'll, I'll tell you all now, it's somebody else I told. In March, I was four days, I was feeling like sick. My throat was hurting, my head was hurting. I was like, and I don't, and I had a temperature of like 100, 100.2. And if nobody told me there was COVID, I would have gone to the gym because I would be like, you know, I could go to the gym, right? Like, what, are you, what are you kidding me? Right? But I knew it was COVID, so I stayed in my bed. I had an antibody test in May. I did have it. Right. So and my antibodies continue to persist. The question is somebody like me, right, who had a mild version. Am I protected? I don't know. I don't I don't think we know. Uh, but if yeah, Mary, anything thoughts on that one? 
So we, we know that viruses mutate. We know that there have been mutations. Uh, we think that a lot of the times it does get less as, uh, um, um, strong a virus, and so it's, yeah. that's better, but we just don't know yet. I think yeah. that's the bottom line, and I think that Dr. Halkidis's point about even people with antibodies, we don't know if it's going to protect, how long it's going to protect, and how much. Yeah. Thank you both. Next question. And just as a reminder, please type in your questions, lower right-hand corner in the chat box. Okay. I love these questions. Yeah, these are really good. Okay. They're great. Uh, how can we understand the difference between the common flu during the winter and cold? Mm -hmm. This is like... <laughs> you can't. You can't. That's the thing. That's the thing. It's going to feel very much alike. I'm telling you, those four days felt like that. You know, it was only the only thing that was really different was that the other when I knew I had it is because I couldn't taste anything. The taste thing is huge. So if you gave me baklava, I wouldn't have been able to taste it, right? It was for a month, and that lasted for four to six weeks for me. So taste, look at the taste thing. And how do you know you can't taste things? This is the trick that I learned. If you look at a food and your taste is not working, your brain's going to send you a signal about what it tastes like, right? And you think you, you think you can taste it. You close your eyes and you have somebody give you a piece of food and see if you can taste it. And then you'll know if you've lost your taste. That's when I knew I lost my taste because I somebody gave me a cheese doodle, one of my favorite foods in the whole world, and I couldn't taste the cheese doodle. Mm -hmm. See, I couldn't believe that because some of my friends are complaining about that and I, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, really, how is that possible? But I guess it happens. It's a, that's, the big, that's the big difference between flu and COVID, that yeah. one. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Okay, let's see. Next question. Wow, they are coming in. <laughs> if we are unsure if the antibodies will provide protection, what other methods are prospective vaccines using to provide us protection? What is the vac? What is the, what are the current vaccines doing? So um, I mean, yeah, yeah I, I I don't know the mechanics of the current vaccine. I think it, they're giving a small like in, in, um. I'm not a small uh, dormant dose of the of the of the disease. Is that how it's working, Mary? And do you know how the vaccine is work? I don't. Um, it's um, I don't know. I, I think it's it's the same idea as smallpox. If you introduce it into the body and the body can handle it, um, the, and then it can control it. But I don't. I'm not qualified to answer what the trials are doing right now with the mechanics around this one, right? The other thing that we we hope is that they will develop more therapeutics. So that right. when people get ill, uh, that we can actually be more effective in, in taking care of them once that happens. So that's the other, not only vaccine, but also therapeutics. Right, like medications, like, so right. like control. I mean, we have like 40 years of HIV research where very effective antivirals have been developed, right? So the, it, we, we are ahead of the game in some ways because we have a body of antivirals out there. But I think like there's a ton, there's a ton of vaccine trials going on. Everybody's using different strategies to try to make it work. All right. Whew. Let's see, we have one more here. Okay, also, do you have an opinion on this long haulers phenomenon of people who have long-term symptoms of fatigue and such, like their immune system is out of whack lasting for months? I think it's possible. There's some people who it's going to it's going to it's going to be the, it's going to be the, like Epstein Barr is another one of those viruses where people have those long term conditions. Look, everybody's going to react differently, right? So, like at the beginning of the I, I talk about AIDS a lot because my research is in this, but like at the beginning of the epidemic, we thought everybody was going to die. Everybody didn't die, right? There's like people who are gonna have survived like 50 years now, 40 years now, right? And they are living you know pretty good lives because of the medications. There's going to be some people who are going to again like the symptoms. 50% no symptoms, 45% some symptoms, 5% really sick. Some people are going to have these long-term effects. Others, it's going to be like nothing happened. Everybody's body is different, and everybody's body is going to react differently. I think as Italians and Greeks, we have good genetic structure, so I think we're in pretty good shape. And I think that's really important to understand that everybody is made up differently, so we're all going to react differently. Some of us are asymptomatic, some of us are not, some of us are going to really suffer from it so i think you know let's just try our best to social distance wear our mask wash our hands and you know and just hope for the best hope this thing is out of here very soon yes that's what we i think that's what we have look we have to 
there's some things we have to give up for a little while longer. Like we, yeah. I would like to, I would like to be with you all. Like I wouldn't like to be at this expo with all of you hanging out and eating and having a good time. I would prefer that than this. But there are some things we're going to have to just give up for a little while. And it's not going to be forever. And it's not too much to ask each other to take care of each other, to give those things up. Right. So, you know, we have like one of our colleagues, Marion and I, who's supposed to have a big wedding this December. She's not going to have it this December. Right. Hopefully she'll have it next December. Right. So you just, you know. No Taylor Swift concerts for now, kids. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. So, Dr. Kalkitis, thank you very much. I, I'm thinking maybe a nice t take home message for our for our viewers. A nice home. Well, first of all, let me thank my colleague, Dr. Pasanante, who is like my my you know my fellow criminal. We like act out in Greece together. You know, you know, she, you know, she's gonna. We're gonna just keep. We're gonna get back there soon enough with our course, and I'll, I'll let you and the guys know about the course, the courses we have become available. My take home message is this: Look, love, look here. I every day of my life, I miss my parents, and I wish I could tell them I love them. So I would say one of our biggest responsibilities right now is to love the people who are in our families, make sure they know it every single day. I call my friends who are in their seventies to make sure that they're okay. Do that. Just be the good human being your mother and father taught you to be. And we will get through this together. That's all we need to do. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank both of you. I would like to thank both of you very much for being with us today and sharing your amazing expertise with our viewers of the first ever virtual Hermes Expo. I am blown out of the water. Dr. Halkitis, your presentation. Wow. Oh my goodness. And like you mentioned before, we can share this with our viewers so they can have this as a reference. Um, also, uh, our friend, my friends, this webinar has been recorded and will be published at, at a later date for you to rewatch and hear again all the wonderful things Dr. Halkitis uh, shared with us. And if anyone has any questions, how uh, can they reach out to you or email you? With yeah, um, I, I actually, I actually, first, the first thing I'm doing is I'm putting in the chat the link. Perfect. Oh, my, I, see my, I see my friend Panos on from my, my brother Panos from course is on here too. Um, but you can find me on the web. You could also follow me on my Twitter at Dean P N Halkitis. Um, you know, at our school at Rutgers, by the way, we have a piece of a tree from Hipp Hippocrates, you know, on our campus there. So I always go by it and feel very proud, as Panos pointed out to me. So I put my, my Twitter there and I put the link there also. And if you go, if you Google me, you'll find my email. You can just email me. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you both very much. Stay Thank healthy you. and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.